Welcome, Praise God TV viewers, and greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, we are beginning our second session on the gospel of the kingdom. And we will begin this day looking at the kingdom sermons and doing the introduction. This will be an introduction to the sermons. As I told you in our first lesson, what you will need is your Bible, something to write with, and a notebook. If you'd like to follow along in our study guide, you can, uh, the study guide on this gospel of the kingdom is available uh, through amazon.com. You can get it there or amazon.in if you're one of our India viewers. So that with the study guide, you can follow along and fill in the blanks with us as we do it. But you don't have to have it. Uh, you can use your notebook, take your own notes and follow along with us that way. So let's begin. Heavenly Father, we ask you to lead and guide and direct our steps through the study. Be with us in this next uh, session that we're doing and guide us through it by your Holy Spirit. May your spirit reveal all truth to us concerning your kingdom. We ask in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Mark 1, 4, 14 and 15 says, After John was put into prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The gospel writers, Matthew and Mark, made it very clear that when Jesus began his public ministry, he began with the, with the pronouncement that the kingdom of God was at hand. And as a matter of fact, when we carefully read the gospels and look uh, at these scriptures, they reveal that much of Jesus' teachings was, were, were actually focused on the kingdom of God. When we read Matthew 4, 23, Mark 4, 11, Luke 4, 42 through 44, and John 3, 3 and 5, we see that Jesus said about the kingdom that the kingdom was, first of all, it's good news. And second of all, we see that the secret of the kingdom was given to his disciples, those on the inside and that Jesus was sent to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus also taught his disciples that they cannot see the kingdom of God or enter the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So Jesus uh, made it clear that the mysteries of the kingdom are, are exactly that, a mystery to those who are on the outside. They don't understand it. They can't see it. They don't they don't recognize it. But for those who are committed followers of him as disciples of his, who are dedicated to his teachings and, and uh, have the Holy Spirit, they're born again and have the Holy Spirit within them, that the Spirit of God will reveal to them uh, uh, what the Jesus' teachings of the kingdom are truly about. The Gospels mention again that the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is mentioned some 85 times in the gospel. And almost every time those terms are used, they're direct quotes from Jesus. Without a question, the kingdom was a very significant part of Jesus' teachings on the kingdom. His teachings on the kingdom differed very greatly from what the expectations of his audience, his Jewish audience, were concerning the kingdom and their, their expectations concerning the Messiah, the one who would establish it. Remember that the Jews had long looked for the Messiah and for, the, and for his kingdom. They were waiting for it. And they had certain expectations concerning that kingdom that had been built up over the years. So when Jesus came and was pronounced as the Messiah and the king of the Jews, and when he began to talk and speak and, and preach about the kingdom and saying that the kingdom of God was at hand, these expectations were all coming into their, the minds of his audience. When we look at John 6.15, we see that the Jews expected that 
the kingdom of heaven would be an earthly kingdom and the Messiah would be an earthly king. And, and when we look at Mark eleven ten, we see that the Jews expected that the kingdom would be an exclusively Jewish kingdom. And also in Matthew 4, 23, when the disciples were asking Jesus about the, when and the kingdom would come and when it would be established, they had in their idea that it was some vague time in the distant future when the kingdom of God would come. And so Jesus had to deal with all of these various uh, expectations during his teaching ministry. And so we see from, John, from Luke 17, 20 and 21, John 8, 23, John 18, 36, that Jesus taught something about the kingdom that they weren't expecting. Jesus taught that the kingdom of the of heaven is within and that it was not of this world. It was not to be just an earthly kingdom. Then in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Mark 13, 10, Luke 2, 10, John 10, 16, and Acts 1, 8, we see that Jesus also taught that the kingdom of heaven is for all people. It was not to be just exclusively Jewish kingdom, but it was God's desire that all whosoever would believe in him would come and have entrance and gain entrance into his kingdom. In Matthew 4, 17 and 10, 7 and Matthew 12, 28, also Mark 1, 15 and Luke 10, 8 and 9, in 1232, we see that how Jesus taught that the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is near you. It's upon you. And it was the Father's good pleasure to give the kingdom. And so this was something that the Jews, was it was unexpected to them. They thought that the kingdom was a physical, visible kingdom that would come and the Messiah would establish it. But yet Jesus was teaching that when he, that the kingdom came, it would be uh, an, an invisible kingdom, a spiritual kingdom, that the kingdom of heaven was within you, the kingdom of heaven was all around you. Yes, the kingdom of God will come in its fullness at the end of the age, when there will be a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. But Jesus was teaching that there was a present reality of the kingdom, that in the presence of the king, Jesus, was where the kingdom was found. And so if we are born again and the presence of God is within us and by his Holy Spirit, then the kingdom is present. And, and we see the manifestation of the kingdom in this present age. And so Jesus had to uh, uh, deal with this uh, expectation of the Jewish, that the Jews had drawn about the kingdom of God. And this, that, that was well established uh, in the Jewish prophecy uh, before Jesus came. And although the phrase kingdom of God in itself was never used in the Old Testament writers, there was a clear and distinct picture of the kingdom that came out of their prophecies and came out of these writings. And from these Old Testament writings, we see that there were three very basic things that the uh, uh, ideas that came out of this, that Jesus, uh, well, actually two that Jesus reinforced, reinforced and the third one that was unexpected that Jesus brought. But the two that Jesus uh, reinforced were, were that the kingdom of, of God would, in the, in the end, is eternal and universal. And that the manifestation of the kingdom in all of its fullness lies ahead on this earth. But Jesus brought with him an, uh, a third uh, idea about the kingdom, something that was, had escaped the Jewish prophets of old. And that was the manifestation of the present reality of the kingdom in this time. And so Jesus in his teachings and in particular in his parables, he revealed to his disciples the keys to unlock the mysteries and the mysterious workings of the kingdom and the power of the kingdom of heaven in their lives. 
You look at uh, Luke 10, 24. It says, For I say unto you, many prophets and kings wish to see the things that you, which you see and did not see them and hear the things which you hear and did not hear them. When uh, we look at Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 24, and in particular looking at verses 9, 11b, and 19, we see that there was a specific purpose for which these disciples were sent out. They were sent out with Christ's authority to demonstrate the reality of the kingdom in word and deed. And so when we think about kingdom in our modern, uh, in our modern uh, understanding, in our modern definition of kingdom, we think of the idea of a, of a nation, something with identifiable borders, with its own government and laws and language and with its customs. However, the biblical concept of kingdom is different. It developed in the Old Testament and it was enhanced in the Gospels and it, it, it expressed the idea or the reign or the sovereignty of God. So when we're talking about the presence of the king, we're talking about, or the presence of the kingdom, we're talking about the reign of God, the kingdom being the reign of God or God's sovereignty where it's working. And when Jesus uh, spoke of the kingdom, he was, uh, he was intending to demonstrate that the reign of God had come, that the reign of God was in this present reality with those who believed in Jesus as their Messiah. So we look at the Old Testament passages of Scripture, and we see a lot of these same ideas expressed uh, in, these, in the understanding of the kingdom. In 1 Chronicles 10, 29, 10, 11, in Psalms 47, 6 through 8, Psalm 93, 1 and 2, Psalm 103, 19, Psalm 145, 10 through 13, and Daniel 2, 44 and 4, 3 we see that there was an understanding that the length of time of the kingdom is not limited. It is everlasting. It is without end. And we also understand that the kingdom was intended to rule over all the peoples and all nations, not just the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, but the kingdom of God was intended for all people and all nations. And also understand that the kingdom is is over heaven and earth that the kingdom dominates and uh, it subdues all of the heaven and earth. The Old Testament contains many passages of scripture that honor God as the Lord of all and for all eternity. Exodus 15, 18 states that the Lord shall reign forever and ever and numerous other Old Testament uh, verses describe the glory, the majesty, and the sovereignty of God. What emerges out of these scriptures is a picture of the kingdom that is eternal, universal, and present throughout human history. It's not just a particular time or place that it comes at the end of the age, but it is there, it's present throughout all time and all eternity. So the Old Testament writers describe the kingdom of heaven in their terminology as the invisible, hidden reign of God over all creation. However, the prophets of Israel also describe a time in the future when God's kingdom will be visible and acknowledged by all. So you see this duality here. On the one hand, we see this spiritual kingdom, this invisible, eternal, everlasting kingdom, which is throughout all time and space and eternity. And then on the other hand, we see it coming in a manifestation at some point in the future in its fullness reality. And so at the, the point is at some point in the future that the kingdom will become visible, visible and acknowledged by all. That's what the that's what the book of Revelation is about. It's about the coming of the kingdom when it is uh, it becomes visible to the whole earth and all acknowledge it in heaven and earth. This is part of the what with the hidden message that we find in the meaning of Nebuchadnezzar's uh, dream of the great statue of gold, silver bronze, iron, and clay. 
in that awesome picture, we see this is the successive kingdoms that would eventually be destroyed and overcome by that one indestructible and an un uh, un uh, uh, dest uh, uh, destroyed kingdom uh, that was not made by human hands, as Daniel two twenty eight through forty five. We see from De Isaiah chapter two verses two through four, and also in Isaiah sixty six eighteen through twenty four. And going back to Daniel, Daniel 2, 37 through 45, Micah 4, 1 through 8, and Haggai 2, 6 through 9. All of these reveal some very important understandings of the kingdom and what the kingdom is, is about. And actually, Isaiah 2, 24, we find its fulfillment in Revelation 21, when the new Jerusalem comes and the future kingdom where the nations gather in a time of peace and not war. The nations will gather and see God's glory, declare God's glory among the Gentiles, and Jerusalem, the holy mountain of God, will be the center of the new heaven and the new earth. The kingdom is from heaven, but it's not just a spiritual kingdom. Not but it comes not by a gradual process of evolution over time where the kingdom doesn't slowly grow and come into fullness, but the kingdom of heaven comes quickly by a catastrophic process where the kingdoms of this earth are broken down. And Micah told us that he will teach us his ways at that time and the Lord will restore the governmental dominion of Zion over the earth. The temple will be filled with God's glory, and it will be a greater glory and a place uh, will, where their peace will reign over the nations. And so it is so, no wonder that the Jews look forward to this time of the kingdom coming. And the, the, but they not only looked at the time of the coming of the kingdom and when it would come, but they also looked uh, forward to the time of who this person would be that would reign and rule over the earth. And uh, there are many prophecies concerning the coming of the Messiah and who that Messiah would be and how to identify who that Messiah would be. We see in Isaiah chapter 11, verses one through 10, a description of the, who this Messiah would be. He would come from the rod of Jesse and the Messiah would come and would be a judge with righteousness and faithfulness and justice to the people. Pre peace will be in his rule. And 2 Samuel 7, 16, it plays into that understanding with the promise of the coming of the Davidic kingdom. And so in Jeremiah it describes the king who will reign with justice and righteousness and execute judgment. And Israel, all of Israel will dwell in safety. Daniel 7, 13 through 14 and 27. Again, it says throughout all the Bible, we find these clouds of glory. And so the Messiah would be shrouded and clouded in the clouds of glory, which is symbolic of the divine majesty and the awesome glory of God's presence that would come when the Messiah came. And the Messiah would rule his flock or feed his flock in strength and majesty. And the name of the Lord would become great even unto the ends of the earth. And Zechariah 9, 9 spoke that the dominion of the Messiah would be free would be, excuse me, would be from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. And so as the Jews were ex anxiously expecting the arrival of the Messiah, they were looking forward to this time and what, how things would change and there would be a dramatic great change over the earth. There are two important foundational truths concerning the kingdom of God that Jesus would reinforce in his teachings. The first was the affirmation that God is king over all the earth. God is sovereign and he's in control of all the nations. He's in control of what's happening. He is behind every event and everything that is taking place in the world today. 
And though his kingdom may be hidden from those who are in the world and they may not acknowledge his kingdom, still Jesus taught that it is revealed to those who diligently seek it. The second foundational truth concerning the kingdom of heaven that we find it, it found in the, in the Old Testament uh, that Jesus uh, confirms is concerning the, the person of the Messiah who would establish a visible kingdom on the earth and he would rule over all the nations of the earth. Jesus clearly stated that the signs of his second coming would be visible to all who are alive at that time and that that his when his kingdom came, it would be clearly seen and there would be no mistaking it. So the kingdom of heaven uh, that, that the Jews were expecting and the kingdom of heaven that Jesus was bringing were indeed uh, understood uh, to be related one to the other. And so in, uh, we will look at Jesus and the kingdom of heaven in our next teaching, in our next session, and how the te Jesus' teachings on the kingdom of heaven were uniquely his. So in one way, Jesus is confirming and affirming many of the Old Testament uh, expectations of the kingdom Yet on the other hand, he is also bringing you teachings that were uniquely his and a revelation that was uniquely his. So we uh, let us pray and close this session and we will see you next week. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of your kingdom. We thank you that your kingdom will come and that your will be done upon the earth as it is in heaven. We pray for your kingdom to come in its glory. And we pray that you will help us to wait expectantly, watching for those things that are to come. At the same time, let us also uh, not uh, ignore or miss the present reality of your kingdom, which is all around us. We thank you. We praise you. We bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.